Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Hey there, Crooked Crew. Rob here. And we've made it to 2021. This is the first Crooked Table podcast episode of 2021. And already I think we can all tell things are about to get weird. So I thought no better movie to open this year and this season, if you will, of podcast episodes than with the 1989 cult classic UHF starring Weird Al Yankovic. But before we get to that episode... You can find more episodes of the Cricket Table podcast on Apple, Spotify, and other podcatchers, as well as crickettable.com. I want to put a little bit of a mission statement for what the podcast is going to be like going forward. So for a long time, we've been saying we cover the world of film from a fresh angle. And so I'm looking to clarify that mission statement a little more going forward. So what does that mean? That means that on this show, we are not focusing on on uh, covering new releases. Obviously, whenever we haven't had very many new releases in 2020 and 2021 looks to be uh, like much of the same for for the foreseeable future. But that's not really ever going to be probably the goal of this show. Occasionally, you know, if there's an Avengers Endgame or something like that, then maybe I'll have to like bend the rules a bit. But generally, we want to cover the, the little scene movies, the underseen movies, the forgotten movies, and focus on films that aren't normally in the conversation. Now, this could be anything from a cult film like today's selection to a movie that I personally love, like Sing Street, which we've already covered, that no one saw but has a very rabid fan base, uh, a film that was a blockbuster and came out and had a bad reputation and maybe undeservedly so, such, such as Speed Racer, which we've covered on the show, or uh, some other Wachowski movies like The Matrix sequels, which Jackson and I talked about uh, at the end of the last year. So that's the kind of thing we're looking to cover here. We're not trying to just ride the wave of whatever everyone else is covering. So we haven't obviously done anything on Wonder Woman 1984, not really planning to probably. Unless somebody has an interesting take on it, I guess. But so we're focusing on little known films, forgotten movies, and ones that are generally considered bad. So bear that in mind as we go ahead with this year of episodes. That's kind of my my thought process here. Shed some light on movies that aren't talked about, keeping it in a a positive context. This is not a show where we want to bash movies in any way, shape, or form. If they are, in air quotes, bad movies, well, what's interesting about them? Let's talk about that. So... But this episode, we're talking UHF with guest Lauren Carey. So let's listen to a little bit of the trailer and then jump into the discussion. Channel 62 has the lowest ratings in the history of television. What they need is a new station manager. No, not him. Forget it. No way. A man of action. Ah! A man of courage. A man of vision. What's your name? Billy. Billy what? What they get is a man so desperate, he'll put anyone on the air. Hey, Stanley. Yeah, George? How would you like your own TV show? Okay. You get the drink from the fire hose! Okay, you ready? Yeah! Open wide! Real He's Conan, the librarian. Today, we're teaching poodles how to fly. We beat up the networks. George Newman, he starts where the others stop. We're the number one station in town. Ah! Orion Pictures presents Weird Al Yankovic in UHF, the movie. Welcome back to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this episode, we are talking about UHF from 1989. And of course, we had to bring Lauren Carey from the Beard Owl podcast onto the show. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So tell people a little bit about who you are and what your show is all about. Oh, yeah. Well, my uh, my brother, John, and I decided actually uh, a year ago today, as of the day we're recording this, was the day we kind of birthed the brainchild of the Beard Owl podcast. It didn't come into fruition until we were both locked down for quarantine. But yeah, basically what we do is we talk about our two favorite things, craft beer 
and Weird Al. And we try our best to pair a craft beer with a Weird Al song and see where the conversation takes us. And so far, we've had a pretty good time. We've had some fun guests on the show and all, you know stuff like that. And uh, yeah, that's what we do. It's beer and Weird Al and whatever else we want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah. What what else is there to talk about? I mean, like you, you guys say at the beginning of every episode, your two favorite things, beer and Weird Al. I'm like, well, yeah, there you go. That's what we got. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there any, I'm just curious, just as a listener, because I've been, I've been checking out your show lately, obviously. Uh, what is, is there any sort of order or a thought process that goes into what songs you covered? Or is it just, hey, I was listening to Off the Deep End the other day and I thought we should cover X. Oh, yeah. It's actually a really good question. So my brother is an engineer. So he's a very organized, analytical kind of guy. So before we even started this, we each kind of individually looked within ourselves and looked at each Weird Al album, or as we call them on our show, each Weird Album. And (laughs) yeah, we, we ranked the tracks like from our most favorite to our least favorite. And then we ranked the albums from our most favorite to our least favorite. And then my brother built what we call our weird algorithm. So we have a spreadsheet with all 163 uh, Weird Al songs from albums. Because there, there's more outside the albums, but all 163 right. from the albums. And we have them ranked from number one to 163. And generally, it's a random number generator. And what happens, happens. Wow, interesting. I didn't realize there was there was so much strategy. As a, as a a long time overthinker, I I feel you in that approach, and I and I think uh, I appreciate that. So so wait, so what about songs like uh, "This Is the Life" or "Spy Hard" or like some random what? Oh, what about um? I was just I was just reminded of this song the other day because it's not anywhere on any album. Is uh, "You're Pitiful"? What about songs like those? Will those be covered at some point? Yeah, we'll get to them either we'll either get to them eventually or I will use those on what I call my very special episodes, which are where I have yes. guests come on to talk about weird owl topics of their choice. The album tracks are basically our canon, and then anything outside of that uh is kind of free range for folks because I think you're coming on my show at some point soon, right? I am. I am yeah. coming on your show. Uh, in a, in a, as of this recording, like a, I don't know, a week and a half or something yeah. like that. I forget. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and, and what we're discussing, I, I won't get into here, but it is film related. So it's funny that you're talking about Weird Al on your show and you come on my movie podcast, talk about the Weird Al movie and Weird Al has a movie related bit of content that I'm going to go on your Weird Al show to talk about. So it, it's, uh, it's all very synergistic, I guess. Yeah, it's all connected, man. It's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, uh, just before we get into UHF, how did your, you know, you and your brother, how did your obsession with Weird Al start? Like, how long have you been a fan? And, and you know, and I say obsession as someone who has all those albums and has is wearing one of the three shirts I have from his concerts <laughs> and all of that. So it's I'm definitely not a knock. Um, we're all about oh, Weird Al here. Good. Um, I... Honestly, I will say that we kind of came of, quote unquote, came of age uh, with Weird Al in the mid 90s with the Bad Hair Day album. But Mm -hmm. Weird Al has been part of our lives, our entire lives, because our dad actually got Weird Al's first album, his eponymous uh, 1981 offering. Uh, He got it on cassette from the Columbia Record Club. Oh, wow. He has been a Weird Al fan since the beginning. He listened to the Dr. Demento show and was in that whole thing. So Weird Al has has been part of our lives since, you know, before we even had lives. And it, we just we were just kind of allowed to discover him in our own way. But mm. it was bound to happen, I think, growing up in our house. Yeah, it's it's we were saying right before we started recording that it's crazy how pervasive he is in pop culture. I feel like he's been out since I think when my Bologna was like what 79, like right yeah. around there. So dude, we're talking about over three decades of Al content and cameo appearances on, you know, The Simpsons or every I think every single naked gun movie, at least the first two. He was um, in all of them. All all three. Was he? He was in all of them. Okay, good. I was yep. gonna say. Um <laughs> Things like pop star, for example. Like, do you have a, a favorite Weird Al appearance in uh, 
in film, I guess, or television before we get to his, his own movie? Oh, that's a really good question. And honestly, I feel like I love him. Um, there's two TV show appearances that I absolutely love. Um, I love his cameo episode of the Goldbergs, uh, where he was playing himself from the eighties and right. it, that it's a very heartwarming episode of that show. And the, basically the theme is like weird Al is that goofy childhood thing about yourself that it's okay to hold on to, um, but let it grow with you. Um, and my other one is uh, 30 rock where he essentially reverse parodies a, a Jenna Maroney song. It, it just, it's so funny because basically like uh, real quick, too long. Didn't read cliff notes. Um <laughs> Jenna and Tracy are upset that Weird Al parodied a very serious song that Jenna did. And so they decide to write a song that is so ridiculous that it can't be parodied. But instead, Weird Al turns this ridiculous song into basically a straight song. And they're like, oh my God, he normal Al'd you. <laughs> it's great. I've seen 30 Rock and I, it's, I, I, I need to re- I need to track that episode down now because uh, that does ring a bell actually yeah. now that you mentioned it. It go it's a, the song they wrote was uh, fart so loud and then he normal owled it into heart so proud to be like a really patriotic. <laughs> oh my song. god, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, in his infinite brilliance, of course. Of course. Let's let's transition here into UHF itself. So this came out in 1989, directed by Jay Levy. So it's directed by Al's manager, which, mm-hmm. which is interesting. And he made $6 million at the box office. It's a, the budget was five. So it, I, I, I'm assuming with marketing, it didn't even break even, which doesn't <laughs> surprise me. Uh, just knowing how, you know, how, how out there this movie is, which, you know, if it wasn't, I think we would all be disappointed, of course. So speak to that, I guess, first. And then, uh, and then I want to hear about your first experience watching it. Okay. Well, first of all, UHF came out in the summer of 1989, which is one of the biggest blockbuster movie summers ever. I'm not going to rattle any of them off for you, but if you feel like looking it up, you'll be like, oh my God, 1989 was a terrible summer to put out a stupid movie. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, it's, I feel like it had to be as ridiculous as it was in order to really be a weird owl vehicle. And I just feel like it's completely underappreciated for what it is. Um, It's not a movie with a great plot, which I guess angered a lot of people, namely um, Roger Ebert. If you have read his review of this movie, it's like, it's dripping with vitriol. It's the the nastiest movie review I've ever read. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to really say about it it's i just love it so much on a very personal level but there are layers to it that like i can convince you to appreciate it if you don't (laughs) no i definitely appreciate (laughs) it so i found a a a quote it looks like ebert called said that weird al's presence in the movie is a quote dispirited vacuum at the center of many scenes and i'm like well you totally didn't get what the movie was going for roger first of all a lot of respect for roger ebert obviously Uh r.i.p but just like it's not that kind of movie. It's it it is. If it had a big plot, a great plot, it wouldn't be a Weird Al movie. Like that's the whole thing. It's a thinly strung together, uh, you know, series of parodies in yeah. in large part, like bro, you know, broad in the broadest of strokes. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, the, I, I think that's in a way that's what we would want from him. Yeah, especially in 1989, because remember, right. like. Uh, putting this movie in the context of like Weird Al's career, you know, he had his first album in 1981 and then um, in 3D came out late 83, early 84. And that's when he became the eat it guy. Right. Right. And then uh, 1985 was dare to be stupid. And that the big hit off of that one was like a surgeon, his parody of like a virgin by Madonna. And then it started going downhill a little bit for him with uh, the album Polka Party, which he got, kind of rushed into putting together didn't go that well didn't perform that well um and then you know he had fat which is good that 
still wasn't quite as great as you know he was doing before that and then they put out UHF in 1989 so his career was in a funny place anyway. Like he was well known enough, but I think if Weird Al put out a movie now, it would be a completely different type of reception. I think if you had put it out a movie maybe a few years later, like right uh, right after let's say the mid '90s, like Amish Paradise t- mm-hmm. time, I think it, this thing would have not you know wouldn't have been a huge blockbuster but it definitely would have made at least three to five times more than it did at the box office and it would have yeah. pulled a decent profit for sure I, it, I you think you would think right but in the mid 90s do you remember weird al's uh tv show the weird al show i do i do and it uh, got canceled after like 13 episodes so I don't know. I mean, I get what you're saying. I feel like a movie probably would have done better than him trying to do a kid's show. Because uh, Weird right. Al, as goofy as he is, he's not f- like kids can like him, but he's not for kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I'm completely digressing, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm but, but I'm thinking like of early '90s movies like Wayne's World. Oh uh, like, yeah, yeah, that's the true. Audience would have gone for this, so. You know, even if you put it out like right after Smells Like Nirvana, I feel like it would have he would have been in a, in a sweeter zone because, you know, you're saying as far as his in context of his career, I feel like off the deep end sort of cemented like, oh, he's back. OK, we're good. Yeah. You know, got yeah, him back on track. Phase two. That, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I do feel like in a way, like the, the style of humor he's going for here does feel in some ways sort of ahead of its time, just with all the cutaway gags. And I'm thinking, you know, in the age of like family guy and things like that, where that kind of absurdist humor is more normalized. I uh, pun intended, I guess, considering it's weird Al. Uh, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that, uh, that there's something that there's something to that. Do you, do you see that also a little bit? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think a lot of those, those things, those TV shows that do those little parodies, um, like you said, you know, Family Guy and, and you know, so many others, they owe more of a debt of gratitude to Weird Al for paving the way than I think they even realize. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So this is obviously Weird Al's first and, you only. know, lamely <laughs> only like starring mo- role, like the movie that he was actually kind of behind. Uh, and the face of, do you, is, is this, does UHF in your mind embody what you think a Weird Al movie would be? Like if this is, this is his one and only is like calling card cinematically. Do you, do you think that it has everything that a, a air quotes, like if they had just called this Weird Al the movie and there's a whole, as I'm sure you're aware, controversy with the title where he hates that title and he wanted mm-hmm. to go the vidiot. And then, mm-hmm. you know, they got released as the vidiot from UHF. And there's like the whole title, uh, you know, story behind it. Is this what you'd consider Weird Al the movie? Like if you were trying to get someone into Weird Al, where would this, you know, what, how, what, what step in the process would UHF be, I guess? Oh God. Yeah. That's a really good question. UHF would not probably not be one of the first steps in my process of trying to get somebody into Weird Al if they don't already appreciate him. Uh, Because you kind of have to have that base knowledge of who Weird Al is, what he's all about, and kind of what he does um, in order to appreciate a lot of things that happen in UHF and what goes on. And it doesn't work for just everybody, especially now, you know, 30 plus years removed from when the movie came out, because there are so many, uh, you know, pop culture references in the film that uh, are lost on a lot of people today. And honestly, some of them were even lost on me, I think, when I saw it the first time. Um, and right. I kind of came upon them retroactively. <laughs> uh, but like even more so today, you know, it's it's not as uh, it's not as easily accessible as it was in 1989 for the pop culture references. But yeah, this would probably be like at least step five on my in- indoctrination <laughs> process. <laughs> well, that, that opens up a good question. What would be your initial, you know, your initial offering as it were, if someone's like, I've heard of Weird Al, but I've never really gotten into his music. Where should I start? What would be the song or album? You'd be like right here. Here's the link to the Spotify. Go for it. Uh, oh, I would probably, uh, it would depend on the person and what kind mm-hmm. of music they're, they're into. Um, and so I'm going to answer this question from, from, actually a place that I'm, I'm currently thinking about right now because um, I'm a 
I'm a college writing professor. And so I've been given permission to design a writing course on parody and pastiche. So I'm obviously including Weird Al in in that whole entire process. And I'm I would think be- he would be the, the centerpiece of the course, no? Is yeah, that, yeah is he that kind Al of 101? I know, I know. I would like it to be Weird Al 101, but I'm trying to <laughs> diversify a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but I am definitely going to use uh, White and Nerdy. Uh, because I think, you know, even though that came out in 2006 um, and it's, you know, a parody of a, you know, a song that was like a minor hit in like 2004, right. 2005. Um, I still think, you know, because there's so many lyrics and because uh, Weird Al showcases his absolutely amazing rapping skills in that song. Um, I feel like, that gives people who may have like a vague idea of who Weird Al is a deeper appreciation of like the talent that he actually has. But at the same time, it also describes who the audience that Weird Al is like generally speaking to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. That's a good point. So that's, no, that's I, the one I'd go with. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And it's also one of his biggest hits, I would say it's like definitely up there. Yeah. It's um, up there. And yeah, I, I think that, that makes sense as far as the genre is concerned. It's also, it's weirdly become a sort of stamp of approval. Like to, to, to your point of, of teaching a college course around parody, it steers the direction of pop culture in a very, in a very uh, tangible way. You think of something like uh, a movie, you know, I just recently covered the matrix sequels. The matrix is one of my favorite movies. It's okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that stuff. So Though would that first movie have been as much of an impact on cinema after its release if it hadn't been parodied four million times in Scary Movie and Shrek, like literally everywhere? Like it, it kept it in the conversation, and I feel like in the same way that you know uh, on on your episode on Poker Power, which I was like, like I told you I was just listening to today, <laughs> uh, you you and John mentioned Blurred Lines, which. I haven't listened to since it came out, but word crimes I'm on all the time, you know? And and so just by that alone, it keeps blurred lines sort of alive in some way and uh, keeps Robin Thicke relevant by association as opposed to the other way around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some weird Al classics, right. Uh, that, you have to kind of dig really deep into your brain to figure out, to remember who the original artist was. Um, uh, For instance, he does a, it's a great song off of actually uh, his least successful album, Polka Party from 1986. There's a song called Here's Johnny, which is all about uh, Ed McMahon saying, here's Johnny. And it's a parody of uh, Who's Johnny by L. DeBarge. Wow. And yeah, I don't even know that song. That's exactly, exactly, exactly. Like I love the song. Here's Johnny, but I think I can count on one hand, maybe one finger, the number of times I've heard who's Johnny by Elda Barge. So he, he, and I guarantee like, obviously the people who wrote the songs that he's parodying are getting some kind of royalty for it. So he's keeping them alive in more ways than one. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but it's always, it's just so funny to me how sometimes he'll cover us, he'll do a parody of a song and, and it'll be like what you like, what we just said, where I, I feel like word crimes has endured more than blurred lines has. But then sometimes, you know, if Gangsta's Paradise comes on, I'm able to go back and forth between the two songs, like, you know, at will that they, they kind of on, they're on par with each other. And I think that's really, that's always really fun when to measure the Weird Al parody against the original and just see like, well, which one has actually made a bigger impact on, uh, you know, over the, over time. And that, yeah. I think, um, yeah, U, UHF, one of the things that I really like about it too is the way that it incorporates the parodies, obviously, but like, it, I mean, it opens literally, you were alluding to the summer of 89. One of the big ones was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So of course this opens up with the parody of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, the little, the tongue in cheek, the fact that he's reaching for an Oscar, it's like Al kind of shooting his, like taking his shot early on, uh, just going yeah. like, 
you know, you're watching an Oscar winning movie, guys. Look, Weird's gonna, Weird Al's going to grab his Oscar right now. Um, is there a particular moment or I guess in, in parody uh, in UHF that, that really stands out to you? Oh, my God. Well, almost all of them. But I will tell you right now, um, as we speak, I am wearing my Spatula City T-shirt. Nice. Um, and though Spatula City is not like directly a parody of of anything um because obviously it's just complete you know it's complete absurdity because like seriously a store that just sells spatulas but the line um cy greenbaum who is the the owner of spatula city he says i like their spatulas so much i bought the company and that's yeah. a, ref- a reference to the the guy that um, bought Remington shavers. You know, I like the mm-hmm. razor so much. I bought the company. So like, <laughs> that's a reference that it, it's a deep, it's a deep reference, but it's like, I'm Cy Greenbaum and I like their spatula so much. I bought the company and it's like, okay, you know, it's just so silly. Um, I like that one. And um, uh, as far as, as far as parodies go, um, you can't, you cannot go wrong with uh, Conan the Librarian. Yeah, that was the one I had in mind as well. Like, <laughs> I, one of the questions I was going to ask, uh, and we might as well get to it now, is is there a particular show on, on Channel 62 that you would want to be real? And my answer was like, I would watch the hell out of season, like a full season of Conan the Librarian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there yeah. a particular one that you're like, man, like Adult Swim or somebody should totally jump on that? Oh my God. Um, that's a really good question too, man. You're asking me some good questions, like stuff. That's I don't really think I know, I know, but that's not, how, this is not how I think about this, uh, <laughs> but I like it. I like it a lot. Um, you know, I feel like it's almost a cop out to say, I would like to watch a full season of Stanley Spadowski's playhouse, but I think I would like mm-hmm. a full season of Stanley Spadowski's playhouse, but like, it would have to be the way it is. Um, and right. I think I would be okay if it got like adult swimmed into a cartoon because it was basically a real life cartoon anyway, because honestly that child drinking from the fire hose would be seriously injured. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> there's so many, there's things in this movie that, that just remind me, they, I, I get the nostalgic lens for eighties comedy eighties, like late eighties, early nineties. Cause you know, I was born in 83. So earlier today I have a, a four year old daughter and, and lately I've been showing her Pee Wee's Playhouse. Oh, and yes. That that whole era of like everything is like puppets and, you know, stop motion and innuendo and all this in like a air quotes kids movie or or show, I guess, in that case. And it's just there's so much of that in here that I really appreciated the absurdism of it all. Uh, and to your point of Spatula City, I mean. We have, I'm in Tampa, Florida over here. We have uh, the container store. So it doesn't feel like that much, you know, there's a chain of stores, I'm guessing, called the container store that just sells containers. It just sells uh, containers. Oh, that's right. You're so, in Tampa. I am. That's right. Um, that's right. So, Good luck hosting that Super Bowl. Oh, I know, right? God. <laughs> <laughs> so between like <laughs> things like that and also the way that, you know, the reality TV of it all, uh, I feel like he didn't realize how dead on some of the stuff was um, at the time. And, and oh my so God. That's, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, uh, okay. Wheel of fish, right. Um, it's a ridiculous game show um, where there's obviously spinning a wheel of fish and there's prizes and things like that. And at the time, like, yes, obviously there were game shows, but there weren't things like wipe out, you know, where people are just like running on things, getting hit with stuff. And I feel like game shows have gotten more ridiculous. So maybe Wheel of Fish either predicted that or let people realize that like, oh, you know, we can be a little bit more ridiculous with that, Uh, you know, but mm, yeah, Wheel of Fish. that's, That's something that's really jumped out to me a lot in, you know, movies in recent years, just the fact that these 
satirical comedies even like the lego movie has the whole uh honey where are my pants like that's a sitcom <laughs> in that in uh bricksburg or whatever just you know I, it, it make it calls to mind the fact that there's like the masked singer and things like that on now that it's like it's gotten to that point that they're like i don't know sure let's make a show out of that and so it feels like uhf again in another way was sort of ahead of the curve um and, and i really love that scene where he has the schedule on the yeah. board and I'm trying <laughs> I to find, they have it listed somewhere in IMDb, like a list of all the shows. Yeah. Uh, There's let's see. So Bestiality today, <laughs> <laughs> Long shark, uh, Buddha knows best dog racing from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, da, da, let's see my three mutants, leave it to Bigfoot. Obviously stainless to Spadowski and then just randomly thrown in there. Beverly Hillbillies, Mr. Ed and a bunch of other, like two real shows. And then, you know, the flying Pope, the young and the dyslexic, <laughs> like I, know, I know i know there's it's, just it's so one of those much. real pause worthy moments yeah yeah that's one of those the parts of the movie that like you have to really pause and look at in order to truly appreciate but obviously beverly hillbillies was thrown in there so that he could do right. the um the, the the dire straits parody beverly hillbillies right, right? Exactly. which is a whole thing in and of itself uh because Weird Al wanted to call that song the Ballad of Jed Clampett, but uh, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits would not allow Weird Al to parody the song unless he was the one that played guitar on the track. So like the the riff that you hear in the Beverly Hillbillies parody that is actually Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits. But that's also the reason why the song has to be called Money for Nothing slash Mm -hmm. Beverly Hillbillies, which is ridiculous. I hope you I hope you at least shouted out dire straits on your episode for people on your episode about people that just didn't get Weird Al clearly because I feel like that's another example of like if they wanted to keep the name of the song the same, it doesn't they clearly just don't understand Weird Al's like a business model, basically. Yeah, you know, I don't think we mentioned that at all because it's like the thing was the parody itself happened. And the video for the song happened. So the song got out there in the world and it is what it is. It's just, it has a very, very stupid legal name. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's also the only part of the movie that's basically a music video just that was just lifted from the film essentially too. Yeah, yeah. And I think they worked that in pretty well because, you know, it's George, which is Weird Al's character, that's George just kind of like daydreaming. Um, so they, they did a lot of that. And I think the way that the, a lot of the parody sequences that aren't like shows on U62 are worked into it pretty well. Like the intro sequence, uh, the, the Indiana Jones, like you had mentioned, that's George's daydream while he's flipping burgers at Big Mm -hmm. Edna's. Um, and he, he and Bob get fired, uh, for, for slacking off while George is daydreaming. And that, you know, Indiana Jones thing is how, that's how that got worked into the film. And then, you know, then you have the, the bit where, uh, uh the Rambo bit, the Rambo. Oh my parody. God. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the way he does the, the Stallone grunts, the noises. Oh, that he makes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It's and the so like funny. rubber muscle suit that he, it's, oh, it's so <laughs> I know, I know we, when we did, we did an episode of our show about UHF, um, that came out on Weird Al's birthday. And we had a couple of people on and we actually ate Twinkie wiener sandwiches. They're not bad, but they're not great. Like it's not the best thing you'll ever eat, but it's also not the worst. Uh, But anyway, uh, we, we kind of had this big discussion. It wasn't a big discussion, but it was more of a discussion than I felt was necessary about the believability of the muscles um, and one of our guests thought that uh, Conan, the librarian's muscles were too soft. He said he didn't buy that as a barbarian. And I He's said, a librarian, okay. technically. It's right in the title. <laughs> right, exactly. And I was like, okay, but are you are you buying the rubber muscle suit on, on Weird Al Rambo? Like, I just, I just don't, I just don't understand. Uh, where people are coming from with these things but like just suspend your disbelief like watching this entire movie is all about spending your disbelief just like letting it happen to you and just enjoying right. it 
It's also, I mean, if we really wanted to nitpick, this is we're in 2021. This is a comedy from the 80s. There are things in here that you could call air quotes, you know, problematic. Michael Richards' performance of Stan Lee, uh, the fact that it's Jay Levy himself playing Gandhi, uh, yeah. things like that. Like if we really wanted to be like, well, that wouldn't fly nowadays. I'm like, well, yeah, it's the 80s. A lot of things don't fly nowadays. So it's like, you know, it, it feel like with comedies, you have to sort of, especially when they're as absurd as this, you have to sort of slack off on that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, completely. And I mean, there's a lot you can even get upset with, um, with Getty Watanabe's character. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, when when they're trying to rescue Stanley, uh, and they jump out of the supplies closet and he yells supplies. (laughs) Like God. Yeah. That's funny, but it's, it's bad. (laughs) Right, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's still funny. Like it's one of those things that, like, I know in my mind that it's bad, but knowing where I'm pulling it from, sometimes, as long as I know that, you know, everybody I'm with has either, you know, seen UHF or or will understand where I'm coming from, I'll just go, oh, mm-hmm. supplies, and <laughs> it's not, you know, me making fun of anybody. Right. It's me quoting a movie, you know. But you gotta you gotta watch with some of these things, you know. You gotta watch where you I, say them. I, I think that's a big distinction with Al, like Al's entire career is that n- even when there are things like that that sort of toe the line, even in you know in his music or whatever, it's never like, he's very rarely, if ever, mean spirited. Like it's he, always in good fun. He he doesn't like get to that point where you know even the things in this movie, like the Gandhi thing or whatever, like it's not making fun of Gandhi. It's not really, I mean, making Gandhi look like a badass is what it's doing. Yeah. Um, it's not making fun of Stanley. He's the most sympathetic character in the movie. So uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just because you're, I mean, you're 100% right. He's never mean. Like he is yeah. never mean. And if he does anything that he feels like offends anybody, he's like, he's crushed by it. Cause I mean, seriously, he's such a good human being. I don't know. Have you seen the, um, have you seen the Weird Al behind the music? It came out in like <laughs> 2000. Yeah, uh, I <laughs> I think I saw it, at least some of it at one point. Uh, yeah. Because I remember the whole thing where he's like, oh, I'm doing, I don't know. Like the, the intro to it is he's just uh, like, why are like, you oh, talking I'm just to me? a pretty normal guy. And he's like, no, you're weird, the announcer says. And they show like the clip from My Lost on Jeopardy. Uh, so I remember little little bits and pieces of it. I would love to go back and find that if it's on YouTube or something, though. Uh, but yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. He's, he, that's not his thing. He's, I mean, he goes out of his way to ask for permission for things when as a yeah. parody, you're kind of covered under fair use. Yeah. If, he doesn't he have really, to. Yeah. Yeah. He exactly. doesn't have to. And, and, and that's just so awesome. And like in the behind the music, it was after the whole Coolio thing happened. I mean, you could see him in that portion of the interview. He was like crushed by the whole thing. He's like, I, I, I thought we had it all squared away and then he got upset about it and he goes, I, I was, I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, Oh, poor weird Al. Like, I love right. you. <laughs> I just want to hug you right now. <laughs> no, he felt so bad. And then there's the, uh, the M and M thing uh-huh. where they has the, uh, I forget. I think that was for an MTV or one of those shows did the interview with him and M and M using the, the you know, yeah, that the was- intersplit. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I've that watched was that. That TV. Al TV. Al TV. There you go. I've yeah. watched that so many times over the years, just like brought it up on YouTube and just like spent 10 minutes just getting into that. And I, we, my brother and I, we used to quote, I think that like we used to, I think we got into Weird Al's music, like officially around the same time that, that you and John did. So like mm-hmm. late nineties, I think we got running with scissors Yep. and yep, then yep. went back and got bad hair day. And then like, running with scissors was like our video game playing music. So we'd play a certain game and then we would just have that thing running on loop. And then since then I've been keeping up with every, all his albums and then gone back and bought the others. And it's like, yeah, it's just, it gets addictive. And it's just like, I don't know. There's something we were saying before the call about how, uh, you know, Bill and Ted, like how that, that franchise is great. Weird Al shows up and face the music as I can attest to, because I've seen it like seven times in the last four months. <laughs> Um, just there's something like sort of comforting about his about Weird Al as a person, as a as a musician, and there you know that it's all good natured. It's not anything that's uh, that's particularly offensive. You know, I mentioned my my daughter. Like she, there was a point where we were playing Albuquerque 
every, probably roughly every day. She'd want to hear. The, she's, I think she'd <laughs> call awesome. it. I think she'd call it the uh, peachy because of the thing where he's like, it's peachy. peachy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we used to play that a lot. Um, so she's, she's really into Weird Al's uh, music already at this age. So, you know, as a parent, there's nothing super objectionable about his music. It's, it kind of works for all ages. And, you know, like you were saying, people have different musical tastes and some things they gravitate more towards than others, but there's something for everyone in his uh, in his career and his oeuvre, as you will. And in we haven't even really talked about his original stuff that much. We're to, to have, focusing mostly on the parodies. And I, I think it's important for us to stress that like only half of his albums, like half of each album is a parody. There's a lot of great original stuff that most people probably don't even know. For, for example, UHF, which uh, I think IMDb or somewhere I read that was only like the fourth original single he had released at that point. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, Because most of the the songs that get released are the parodies because that's what's going to, you know, hit with people. Um, But yeah, his original music and his pastiches or his style parodies are some of my favorite Weird Al songs. You know, Uh, the man is incredibly talented and he's got a great sense of like what is going to sound good in a song? And I feel like that's a really basic thing to say, but it's, it's like how I feel. Um, he writes really, really good songs. And yeah. um, the, uh, a great example um, is the song. It's off of his last album, Mandatory Fun. Um, the song is called Mission Statement. Mm-hmm. And it's a, a Crosby, Stills and Nash style parody, kind of in the, in the, in the vein of sweet judy blue um and it's like i said it's called mission statement but the whole the lyrics of the entire song are just like empty corporate jargon so the song doesn't actually say anything but it's beautiful and i listen to that every time i get off of like a company town hall from my from my work nice. because it's like okay <laughs> they said nothing so I'm going to listen to this and like feel a little bit better about the fact that they said nothing <laughs> I share it on LinkedIn I think almost all the time which <laughs> you know it feels like a very um you know <laughs> subversive thing to do but there you go <laughs> I really like uh speaking of mandatory fun I really like uh first world problems uh, that's one that that my wife and I reference a lot. Like if one of us is like, oh, you know, this thing that's like such a first world problem. I, I think I'll like, like turn to her and I'll go first world, first world problems. Just yeah. it's, it's so, it, you know, that's a whole a subset of his humor that I really love where it's yeah. just, you know, kind of putting things in perspective. I, I He's got the, um, I think it's on, crap, what album is that on? It's on Poodle Hat or one of those, the... Uh, why, why does, does this, this always, always happen, happen to, me? to me? Oh my God. So great. I yeah. love it so much. Why does this um, always happen to me? That's actually, uh, okay. Uh, First world problems is a style parody of the Pixies. And why did, why does this always happen to me is a style parody of uh, Ben Folds and the like. Oh yeah. I guess that yeah. does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. Both of those songs are, they're taking something familiar. So like it's a, a, you know to to say it like Alex Trebek it's a genre of music that you're familiar with um right. but it's kind of putting you in your place at the same time it's right. like yeah okay like why are you complaining about this very 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 small thing like exactly get over yourself here's a whole <laughs> song about telling you to get over yourself <laughs> yeah the friend of his I think that got decapitated in an auto accident is like there's five bucks that I'm never gonna never see gonna again see- God, great. Um, I'm gonna have to listen to that after we're done with this call. Um, you should. Yeah, no, there's there's certain there's certain themes that recur a lot in his in his work, uh, you know, such as that. And then he's got the movie recap songs and the songs about technology, obviously food, food and television, yes. which both have their own compilation albums. Um, but yeah, this movie feels like in a way it's either the genesis or sort of just like the crystallization of a lot of the Weird Al-isms. You know, you mentioned the Twinkie Wiener sandwich, the spatulas in here, like things like that. There's a lot of things that become running Weird Al gags that are in, included in this movie. And I, yeah. I think that you have to give it some props for that as well. Yeah, I think, okay. 
he, I think that um, a, a firm understanding of the movie UHF is like a secret language between devote, devout Weird Al fans. So if I'm wearing my Spatula City t-shirt out in public and somebody actually understands what mm-hmm. it's from, I know that that's like my kind of person. <laughs> Uh, you know, or, or I've got, I have a, I have a Raul's wild kingdom t-shirt and I also have a wheel of fish t-shirt and any of those. Um, cause I, I will wear them out, you know, in the world. And sometimes people well, every me, day this year so far, right. According to your Twitter. Yes. Every day so far in <laughs> okay. 2021. I've so worn let me ask you, since I have you here to put you yeah. on the spot, how many weird owl shirts do you have different weird owl shirts? Because I only have the three and I'm like humbled in your presence. Oh, oh, I, okay. Um, I am including <laughs> the one that uh, just came the other day from my own podcast. So I bought a beard owl podcast t-shirt. So that's going to count because nice. it's, you know, it's in the, counts. Yeah, it's absolutely. in the vein. Um, so I'm up to 20. Okay. All right. Nice. Yeah. I had 14. So I was able to go the first 14 days of January, 2021 without repeating a shirt. Um, but so now far, you're like, I need just, I need to stock up. I need to get need to a full up, but, month's but, uh, worth. Like, yeah, well, here's the thing. I feel like, you know, with, even with 14, you know, I yeah. I could go a long time. That's two weeks, you know, like yeah. how often, yeah. do you, you know, like that's, that's good enough, but I needed, I needed weird owl clothing for different occasions. Uh, meaning I needed something that could pass as business casual if it had to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, seriously, you know, and like you, you know, as well as I do living in Florida, that it's going to get too hot to wear some of these t-shirts because they're old, late nineties, early two thousands, really, really thick cotton Mm t-shirts. Um, so they're going to go out of the rotation, um, once the, you know, once the mercury hits a certain level. Right. Uh, Right. Yeah. My, uh, I have the, uh, straight out of Linwood tour shirt which is that big print on the front and it just gets so sweaty sometimes after a while so yeah, yeah uh, I, I feel you. what's the print on the front of that is it him? uh it's the album cover it's the uh oh the, the, oh the oh okay yeah, i don't on. have that one i because i saw that tour two twice i saw him twice oh, okay wow. a linwood tour so i have two shirts from that tour yeah i've got one where it's like he's in like a like a gangsta outfit sitting on a tricycle <laughs> Right. Wow. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And I have a white and nerdy t-shirt. So that's, that's what I got from that tour. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Such a dork. You, <laughs> it's all good. This is, a, we're all weird here. That's um, true. So, so we, you mentioned Raul's Wild Kingdom. So I, I, we should probably just throw that out there that Trinidad Silva, the, the man playing Raul, he, mm-hmm. uh, the movie's dedicated to his memory. He passed away apparently soon after filming was concluded, but we'll always have the line. We don't need no stinking badgers. Badgers, badgers, we don't need no stinking badgers, which of course in and of itself was a yep. um a, a parody of the, the, the treasure of Sierra Madre. Right. Deep cuts again, like you were saying. Deep cut, like, like from a 1948 movie. Who? Badges. Right. <laughs> who who of like the younger generation, you know, the tweens and up, like the younger people who are fans of his music or starting to get into Weird Al. Like who of those people have seen the treasure of Sierra Madre? Nobody. And understand like, oh, that means badges. I get it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, no, no. It, and it's, it's one of those things that it's like, oh my God, there's so many levels that like, you don't, you don't even get, you don't even necessarily get right away. Like um, one of the best parts in the movie is um, when Stanley takes over the show these floors are dirty as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> yeah. The network right. reference. Yeah. Right. The network reference. Like seriously, I didn't get that the first time I saw this movie, which right. uh, to answer yeah, a question that. that you alluded to at the beginning of this, I don't remember the first time I saw this movie because I think yeah. I've always known this movie. This is one of those movies that I can't tell you the first time I saw it. Cause I feel like I've always known it. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can see that. I so, I don't know mine either. I I feel like I've I feel like it, I just probably absorbed it by osmosis over the years. You know, you know, catching it on cable over the, uh, or on a weekend, or you know, you see little like we said earlier. I think we see little bits and pieces, clips from it 
in his in concerts, like when he's going to costume change or uh-huh. or whatever, like they'll show little pieces of this movie, like little some of the the Gandhi too, like some of the parodies uh, from the film. Uh, and then I watched it all the way through like a couple years ago, I think. And I was like, oh yeah, I kind of feel like I've seen this, but I don't, yeah, I can't pinpoint exactly when that might have been. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's just one of those that if you're a Weird Al fan, you just sort of, it just kind of is inst- like automatically downloaded into your head the more Weird Al music you listen to. Is it something yeah. like that? It's just, uh, it's just there. And you know, I'm going to draw a, a little parallel because this is what my brain does. Um, but you wait, Jeff, right? Cause it's all these little bits and pieces. There is a plot, but there's so many just like moments that are iconic in it. And mm-hmm. you can't always remember what order they're in, um, in the same way. Like this is in the same, uh, Rolodex file in my brain as a Christmas story. I could see that. Yeah. Uh, because like that is on obviously for 24 hours on Christmas day. And so like, whenever you catch it, like you're going to catch a bit that, you know, but like, how does that movie start? How does it end? Yeah. That's a exactly, good point. You know? And so UHF is very similar in that way. It's like, there's so many iconic bits, but like one of the things that got, knocked for when it first came out was like there's not much of a story to it well it's like okay that's not the point much like a christmas story even though it's called a christmas story like the story is not the point it's the anecdotes are the point much like with uhf the the parodies are the point yeah it's like what do you need this this uh you know daydreamer played by weird al gets a a station uh you know a uhf station and hilarity ensues so it's like how much there, that's. I feel that feels like a kind of a a low blow uh, criticism, considering there's that was kind of the the way a lot of comedies were at the time. You know, it, it's just yeah. it just feels like they were picking on Weird Al because like, hey, this guy's not a movie star. I'm like, well, screw you guys. It can be. We won't be if you don't let him. That's why he never made another movie. It's yeah. Just like, oh, this crushed him. So like, you notice like. Yeah. The, the gap between UHF in 1989 and then him coming out with um, Off the Deep End in 92, that's like up to that point, that was his longest gap between projects. Mm-hmm. And that's for a reason, because he was like, oh, my God, what they, they hated it. Everybody hated it. Like everybody hates Weird Al, but like, no, no, everybody loves Weird Al. Just people don't always understand Weird Al right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, so. yeah. Give, give it 30 years. Everybody's going to love this movie. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No. And it's, it's a testament to even movies that as, as weird as this, like they, they'll find their way. They find their audience. Um, and with him, he's got a built-in audience. So it's just, of course, we've all sort of gravitated to UHF over the years. Yeah, it's like you said, it's one of, if you're a Weird Al fan, or if you're a person that appreciates a certain type of humor, this is the kind of movie that you can fall back on for comfort, you know? Mm. Uh, Like, if I'm having a bad day, I'll just say, you know what, I'm going to put UHF on in the background, listen to something familiar that I can kind of recite along with as it goes, and I'll feel better when it's over. And I I think... I don't think that was Weird Al's intention in putting this movie out, um, but I feel like he might be happier with it having a legacy like that for it being like a place of comfort for a lot of people than he mm-hmm. would if it was this huge blockbuster comedy that, you know, was a big hit when it came out, but that people maybe forgot about later. Right. I mean, like it, 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 in a world where this had been one of the highest grossing movies of 1989 or whatever. Like, what would the next step have, step have been for him? Would he have done know. more movies, a sequel to this? Like, I feel like that would not have worked out for him either because his his sensibility in a way is so broad, but in another respect is very, feels very niche at the same mm-hmm. time, if that makes sense. It does. Like, that absolutely makes sense. Like, he can cover a lot of things, but in a very specific way. Right. So there's only so much that Weird Al can actually do, like, as far as, like, movies goes. And I guess that could be partly why the Weird Al show didn't work out either, was because it, it was just like, oh, that's just Weird Al on my TV again. But it, watch the Weird Al show with your child. 
Um, see what your kid thinks about it uh, because <laughs> it's it's very similar to Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah, did it, and it came after Pee Wee's, obviously. I'm assuming. Yeah, it, it was came 90s, after Pee Wee's. Right? Yeah, this was yeah. Ni- uh, the, the year of our Lord, 1997. Uh, uh, okay. For 13 glorious weeks in 1997, <laughs> we had the Weird Al show. Um, so, so that was his post Amish Paradise bump. That maybe this should have been, like I was saying earlier. It yeah. sounds like, and, and it's like, yeah, and you know, maybe this didn't work at the time. Like a lot of his projects didn't work at the time, but a, he has his, you know, incomparable music career where all of these music comedy acts, the Lonely Island, Tenacious D, like all these people with Flight of the Concords wouldn't exist without Weird Al or they wouldn't yeah. be popular at least without Weird Al. Let's put it that way. Right. And, I mean, they all owe, they owe him a tremendous, tremendous, right. tremendous debt of gratitude. Yes. A hundred percent. And that's why, you know, in addition to that, he's had a movie, an animated show, like, you know, all these other opportunities along the way that he wouldn't have if he didn't like, if your baseline is Weird Al's music career, you're doing just fine. (laughs) This is my point. Like it didn't, it didn't work for everyone, but Weird Al fans now have a movie that they can go back to. So I, I think, you know, you could say the same thing about Lonely Island, pop star. Nobody saw pop star in theaters except for me and my (laughs) wife, I guess. Oh and gosh, yet that's there true. are people that love it. There are people really that love true. it. I, I've done an episode on the podcast about it. So it's it's like that that pop star is like UHF, but like 30 years later, like it's going to grow and it's going to have legs and it's going to, you know, achieve a kind of a similar cult status. So uh, I, I think in a way like UHF is very underappreciated for the role it plays in his career. And also I was noticing while I was watching it for this episode, that it's really kind of like a nexus point for so much comedic talent that's in here. Like you, Victoria yes, Jackson, oh my God. Lee, who was in SNL, Michael Richards, but right before Seinfeld, Fran Drescher, which, you know, love her or hate her, right before The Nanny, like a few years before The Nanny was a thing for a decade or whatever. Even John Paragon, who plays the, one of the sons of, of the villain, who character, mm-hmm. whose name I'm forgetting. He was Jombie on Pee-wee's Playhouse. The guy yep. who at the end falls in the mud and is like, Dad. that guy like there's uh-huh. so much billy Barty, and of course we got to mention emo phillips oh my god who, with one emo of the best phillips. scenes in the movie um and he opened for the uh the ridiculously whatever the 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 um i don't remember the, the ridiculously name of the tour, the self-indulgent one indulgent ill-advised vanity tour yes thank you he i think he opened for him on that tour so he i did. actually saw it Me yeah too. i saw emo phillips and then it was so great yeah yeah my brother um my brother i gotta wish my brother john was here because he does an amazing emo phillips impression because oh, wow. he loves him from like this movie and then when he opened for al on that tour my brother actually bought an emo phillips comedy album <laughs> so my brother tells a joke it, it's uh and it's an it's an emo phillips joke and he goes i went into the pet store and the guy says hey do you want to buy a cockatoo and I said, no, I'll just take the bird. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. And I, I totally butchered that. My brother does it so much better. But like it's it, Emo Phillips, like seriously, he's such an acquired taste, too. Yes, but for sure. He is perfect for the role he plays of the, the like the hapless shop teacher in this movie. And oh my God, I, it just makes me so happy. Call me Mr. Butterfingers. Oh, and after he cut his thumb off, like Mr. <laughs> Butterfingers. Boy, is my face red. Red. <laughs> oh man, so much fun. That's it. And that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like there's so much, this movie just kind of, it feels like a time capsule of that point in, you know, the late eighties, early nineties comedy scene. That yeah. weird all kind of that UHF just kind of like pulls from all these different corners and all these people who are on the verge of about like their careers are about to explode. And I think that in that way, it's like a, a whole other level of appreciation that I had for it watching this latest time. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's so true. Cause I think mm, I think Michael Richards is so incredibly likable in this movie mm-hmm. in a way that like he's he's. I love Seinfeld and I love Kramer, but Kramer is not likable. Kramer is funny. I get a kick out of Kramer 
I, I get Kramer for what he is, but Kramer is not like a likable guy. Stanley Spadowski is just a likable guy. And you know that he is like meaning so well. And mm-hmm. I also feel like the character of Stanley Spadowski gave Michael Richards the opportunity to do a lot more um <sighs> Cause he's great with physical comedy, but it gave right. him a lot more opportunity to act with his face. If that makes sense. So, you know, cause like Stanley does these facial movements and you don't, you get a lot of like body comedy from Kramer, but not a lot of face comedy from Kramer mm-hmm. where you get no, a lot of true. face comedy from Stanley Spadowski. Yeah. Well, and he's supposed to, he's the innocent of the movie. Kramer, to your point, there's always something kind of off-putting about really, I mean, if you're really getting down to it, it kind of all four of them on that show. Like there's, you don't want to hang out with the leads of Seinfeld. That's why by the end of the series, when they get thrown in prison, spoilers for Seinfeld, I guess, (laughs) when they get thrown in prison for being terrible people, you're kind of like, at the time, I think everybody was like, well, that's a dissatisfying ending. But then over the years, you're like, but yeah, they kind of suck. They're kind of like the worst people. So I guess that makes sense. That they just nine years of season, of uh, episodes, they pulled the wool over our eyes and got us used to these people just being terrible. And that was like yeah. how it was. Yeah. No, they're terrible. Yeah. Thank you so much for that 23-year-old spoiler, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh my God. Seriously, that's 23. It ended in 98 and this is 20, mm-hmm. uh, 2021. That's, yep. that's, that spoiler has been able to drink for two years. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh my um, God. But yeah, yes. We're Stanley. <laughs> oh, I know. God. Um, I know. <laughs> but Stanley does, you know, in lesser hands, that performance uh, could have been mocking, could have been offensive, especially by today's standards. Yeah. But there's nothing like when Stanley's funny, it's because Stanley is, is for the most part, Stanley's trying to be funny. He's being goofy. He's being into it. He's being like, kind of childlike but there's yeah. nothing about where the movie is not saying oh look at this idiot like the people that do that in the movie are the villains of the movie so that kind of puts in perspective the way the movie feels about stanley yeah absolutely absolutely like 100 percent. i mean stanley is like lovably simple and i say that in the right. most like uh, you know appreciative and like kind way yeah absolutely I also wanted to just point out the, the fact that Weird Al is kind of the straight man through a lot of this movie, which yeah. I thought was is really interesting, <laughs> at least in the in the parts that are based in real life. Uh, in, in when he goes into his daydream, he's more Weird Al, like what we would expect Weird Al to be. But yeah. I, I think that's beautifully ironic that in the Weird Al movie, uh, Weird Al is is the least goofy of, of the cast of characters that we meet. And also, I feel like it says something to... It says something about Al himself that he was like, no, yeah, I want to be in the movie and I'll, you know, help put put it together. But I don't want to, I don't need to be like every single laugh doesn't have to come from me. I'm going to tap in all these other people. Like I was saying, all these other comedic talents who could use an opportunity and, and make this movie better and kind of elevate it rather than just, you know, me just being, you know, uh, the center of every single joke. And so I think that's, I think that's a testament to, you know, how seriously he took this opportunity to branch off into film. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think it also speaks to, you know, Weird Al as a person um, in mm-hmm. that he, he he was doing this project, but it was never intended to be all about him. You know, just like you said, like there's so many amazing comedic talents in this film that he wanted to make sure they got their moment you know, their, their chance to be showcased and all, almost all of the like little bit lines that people remember from this film are said by characters other than Weird Al's character. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and I, I I think that's kind of amazing. Uh, Cause this is more of an ensemble film than just the Weird Al movie. You know? Exactly, and I, I don't think it gets enough credit for being the ensemble film that it is. And uh, so I, I guess if I'm going to put anything out there in the world today, that's going to be it. UHF is an ensemble film. <laughs> and that's that's what I'm going to rest on. And it's an ensemble film that ends with a, an alien reveal. We didn't even talk about Anthony Geary, who <laughs> might. Philo. I, 
<laughs> Philo, who who I, I you know the, when I watched this a couple of years ago for the first time and probably forever, uh, I, my parents, you know, we I watched General Hospital yes. as a kid, <laughs> and so I was like. Oh my God, is that Luke Spencer? Let's What's Luke. he doing here? <laughs> Why yeah. is he acting strange? And then when he ended up being an alien, I was like, eh, that, that checks out. Yeah, isn't that nuts? I mean, like, that's the whole thing. Like, that makes you, oh, oh my God. It, it made that whole thing makes the whole movie make so much more sense because this is basically right. an, a live action cartoon anyway. And fun fact. The claymation on Philo's alien reveal scene at the end is done by the same claymation artist that did a uh, uh, large march. Large march. From I was Pee-wee. that yeah. it, it. It reminds me of that hardcore. It's, like it's I said, the same one. Pee Wee was huge part of my childhood. That movie and the show. Uh, and Big Top Pee Wee, I haven't seen in probably thirty years because. Oh my god, Big Top Pee Wee is actually my preference. Is uh, it really? I need to. Uh-huh. Like I said, I've been watching Pee Wee's Playhouse and I was like, it's, it went on Amazon and it's like there for on DVD for like five Get bucks. I'm like, big top dare Pee-wee. I, dare I big top Pee Wee? I don't know if we, I don't know if we ended things. Oh, do it. Uh, Chris amicably. Christopherson has like this. Benicio the Toro is what? the the dog tiny, boy. Yes. Oh, yeah. he's the dog boy. And then, and then <laughs> Chris Christopherson's the ringmaster with the, the tiny, tiny little wife. I think it's Dolly Parton. Oh my I God, think that'd it be is. Hilarious. I think it is. Um, and then Pee Wee, of course, falls in love with this beautiful, exotic, like trapeze artist. And oh, it's. Oh man. All I, right. It's, it's not as I... like. I, I find that one a little more. A little more comforting than Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um, Because Pee Wee's Pee Wee's Big Adventure always like stressed me out a little bit because it's such a big adventure. <laughs> but um, Big Top Pee Wee. Yeah, it's it's, it's top, just a nice the top story. should be big, not the adventures, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I want a big top, not a big adventure. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, all these movies are all kind of in the same, you know, the same little area there. They they yeah. they overlap on whatever that Venn diagram is. No, it's just I, I earlier today watching Pee Wee's Playhouse with my daughter, and I had that you know I also thought of like I said thought of Large Marge with with uh, his Philo, Philo's Philo or Philo Philo I think it's with Philo's, Philo Philo's, yeah yeah Been whatever um, it's like uh, how do you say Euro it's like Philo Euro whatever um, yeah. <laughs> uh, with his his transformation there and I was just like man I didn't realize until I go back as an adult like how much this vein of comedy. Weird Al, Pee Wee Herman, like influenced my sensibility, my, 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 you know, the kind of humor that I, that I gravitate towards. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really, always really fun to go back to these older movies and kind of uh, see like where it all started for, uh, you know, for our generation, just coming up, watching these things and having this kind of be our, uh, our comedic education, I guess, as it were. Yeah, like gut check yourself. Like, oh, this is where I came from. This makes so much sense now. Yeah. I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So, Lauren, I uh, I don't have a whole lot else here. Is is there anything about UHF we haven't talked about that you wanted to make sure we mentioned before we start winding down? I really just have a couple fun little tidbits that I feel like Do I it. need to share. Need to share. Um. Because. It was introduced, obviously, and released in a couple different countries around the world. And the translation of uh, (laughs) some of the international versions of the title of this movie make me chuckle. Uh, So, for instance, in Hungary, uh, UHF was released as the Wavelength of Madness. And in Norway... I kind of like that title. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't it kind of great? Um, <laughs> UHF is so generic. Wavelength of Madness sounds more like, yeah, that sounds like a weird, weird out in the way. It sounds like the Doctor Strange movie that Marvel has coming up, like Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. It sounds like that, that yeah. sort of vein. So that could have worked. It could have worked. And then, uh, oh my God, because there's, there's like three more good ones. Um, in Norway, it was called The Air is for Everyone. Okay. Uh, in Greece, uh, the deafest station in town. And my personal favorite, um, oh my God, okay, it was the German translation of the title. 
um, which is UHF transmitter with limited hope. <laughs> <laughs> or in, in German, it is Sender mit Beschrocker Hoffnung. They should have released it here with the German title. Yeah. That, that, UHF that's what they should have done. Transmitter with limited hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice. but it's like oh my god it's so funny the air is for everyone right that's the one they're like hmm, I, I, yeah i mean t- technically it's kind of uh yeah i, 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 I guess that you know because uhf is that ultra high frequency it's kind of like right. your, pub, your public station whatever but yeah i just felt like there were a couple of super amusing international release titles to this film that i felt like uh the world needed to know Yes, I feel like my life is that much richer for knowing about the, uh, the wavelength of madness, <laughs> the uh, the transmitter one that you just said and I forgot already. So like, maybe that's why it wasn't a good title. Transmitter with limited hope. With limited hope. God, yeah, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, deafest station in town. I Only if it was D-E-F, then it's- I would allow it. Yeah, no, it's D-E-A-F. It's yeah, like see, deafest. Nah, no, like, like do what do you do in Greece? <sighs> in Japan, it was Parody Broadcasting Station, UHF. <laughs> See, that's a little too on the nose now. That's right. It's on the nose. That's like, yeah. <laughs> God, so funny. But yeah, it's been a ton of fun talking UHF. I could talk UHF like forever with everyone. If I were to be like one of those like door to door, like, hey, have you heard about our Lord and Savior people? It would be Weird Al and UHF. Um. So I appreciate any chance I get to talk about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And I'm looking I'm looking forward to speaking with you and John about more Weird Al. Lauren, tell people where they can find your show and where, where you are on social media. Oh, absolutely. You can find our show basically anywhere you could find your podcasts. I know we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We just got on Pandora, which is kind of cool. I don't know who listens to podcasts. Wow, nice podcasts on pandora but we're there um any of your other podcast players we are probably there and if we're not let us know and we will try and get on there um but we are on twitter at beard owl podcast that's b-e-e-r-d al podcast um same on instagram at beard owl podcast and facebook same thing facebook.com slash beard owl podcast and we just started our tea public store. So we have some t-shirts and stuff uh, available. And uh, like I said, I'm adding them into my rotation of my hashtag Weird Al Every Day 2021 t-shirt crusade. So nice, nice. Yeah. Gotta <laughs> gotta keep the year going strong. It's maybe it was maybe you wearing Weird Al shirts every day will, will be the the glue that holds this year together and prevents another you know, 2020 from happening all over again. Maybe you know you're what? the only, maybe that's the uh, wavelength of madness that right there. Maybe I, maybe I am the wavelength of madness. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe me wearing my shirts. <laughs> it's the wavelength of madness. That's going to hold the entire universe together. And if so, that is a very heavy mantle, but a mantle I am prepared <laughs> to. Yeah. No, agree. no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. The transmitter of limited hope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, on T Public, I think I can get some tank tops. So, being in Florida, much like you, I can get myself a couple tank tops and be okay. Uh, okay, there you go. To do this, so I, I'm in this for the long haul, people. So, if anybody has <laughs> any suggestions for different Weird Al shirts <laughs> that you want me to try and find, let me know. Because <laughs> awesome. I need to expand my wardrobe, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well lauren um, this has been so much fun thank you thanks. for coming on the show uh we'll have to come up with something else for you to talk about another time we'll have you back on since there's only one weird owl movie damn it i know, um, right. I know. <laughs> we'll come up with something possibly not weird owl related but we'll have to come up with something else to get you back on here this was a ton of fun so thanks so much and uh we'll be we'll be in touch yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I will I have more interests than Weird Al, so you know, pick my brain a little <laughs> bit. I promise you we can talk again. This has been great. That's all I have for you this week. Once again, I want to thank Lauren Carey of the Beard Owl podcast for coming on and bringing UHF to the table. 
You can, of course, again, find episodes of the Crooked Table podcast on Apple, Spotify, and other podcatchers, as well as crookedtable.com. And stay tuned for some interesting episodes we have lined up. Not exactly sure what's going to be next, working on the schedule a little bit and kind of finessing that. If you can give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. And thanks for joining us at the table. This has been a production of CrookedTable.com. All rights reserved. That's the yard of the little KED.